please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. And as you do that, I want to reflect on a promise that Jesus makes that speaks directly into our theme today. You see it up there? Finding rest. All right, last week we talked about the need to stand firm because there's a danger. The danger is hardened hearts. So when we drift, and then we begin to neglect, and then when we ignore God's truth, here's what happens. Our hearts grow cold and calloused and rebellious. The deceitfulness of sin, chapter 3, verse 13, says it right there. It leads to a hardened heart. So we have to be careful that we don't go there. Sin is deceitful. It's trying to trick you with empty promises, quick fixes, immediate gratification. So if you think you are standing firm, what does it say? Be careful, lest you fall. But hard hearts probably left church a while ago. It's too convicting for them to listen to the Bible week after week when they're deep in sinful patterns. I, I actually had someone tell me once they were leaving our church because we spent too much time in the Bible. <laughs> Sad to see them go, but no apologies for being too Bible-focused. Okay, but still, those of us who are here, we still need to be careful. That's chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to see it today for the third time in two chapters. Quoting Psalm 95, it says this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So God has something important to say to us today. And today's text is about this promise of rest. Rest. How many of you like the idea of getting some rest? Yeah. Yeah. Sunday afternoon nap on anyone's agenda? Yes. But restless hearts are a little different. A nap is good, but a restless heart needs more than a nap. So here's the promise that Jesus makes. I want us to reflect on Matthew 11, verse 28. He says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not talking about taking a nap. He's talking about a weariness of heart, a heart that is burdened. Now, I love the, uh, the message translation here. We'll put it on the screen. It says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. So the rest that God offers us is recovering the life that he made you to experience, to know him, to be with him, to be loved by him and forgiven by him, to be full of purpose and meaning. But to find that, where do we have to come? To Jesus. See, you, you won't find it in religion. You won't find it in any of the spiritual baggage that you may have picked up along the way. Just put it down and hold on to Jesus. That's what the author of Hebrews has been telling this struggling church that was under pressure, a church that was tempted to give up. He says, hold on to Jesus. Don't let go. He's the only one who can give you this kind of rest. Deep, fulfilling satisfaction for your restless heart. Well, why do we have restless hearts? We get a clue in Ecclesiastes 3.11. We'll put it on the screen. It says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's 
See, as human beings, we have heaven hardwired into our hearts. Eternity is what we were made for, for glory, for a relationship with God. That's what we saw in Hebrews chapter 2. But remember, something happened. Sin has cut us off from what we were made for. So now, we have restless hearts. Augustine, so many years ago, observed this. He said, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find the rest in you. You will never find the rest that your heart longs for until you find it in God. This is why God has spoken through the prophets and has spoken to us by his Son to call you home. Years later, Blaise Pascal, brilliant scientist, said this, inside the heart of every man is a God-shaped vacuum that cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. See, God wants to satisfy this restlessness in our hearts. And Hebrews 4, getting to our text today, says, the promise still stands. God is still offering this rest to us. So here's our big idea. Jesus wants you to find his rest. Pretty simple. He wants you to find his rest. That's good news. He's not hiding it. But as we read earlier, we have to, we must come to him to get it and hold firm to him to keep it. Well, let's pray. Lord, we need this encouragement today. We need this good news that you want us to find your rest. You, there's a promise that you've made. It still stands. So Lord, even as we're just saying, we hold on to those promises. We hold on to you. Show us the way, Lord, even this morning, so that our souls, we would find rest for our very souls. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Jesus wants you to find his rest, and Hebrews 4 is going to show us the pathway to rest. And the first part of that is this. The promise of rest is secured by faith, okay? ongoing faith, continuing faith, uh, the faith of today. Well, we Already in the book of Hebrews, we've talked a lot about listening to God's voice. Today, if you hear his voice, but hearing is... It's not enough. You, you have to act on what you hear. And the action that matters, the action that secures the promise is faith. It's more than simple belief. It's trust. So let's, let's read chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. All right, so he's referring to the Israelites. They heard the promise of rest. They were told about the promised land. That was good news. But it only benefited them if they believed, if they continued to believe. And you know the stories of how they were rescued from Egypt, how God did all the miracles. It was, it was a pretty dramatic conversion story. 
right? The rescue was spectacular, it was miraculous. But getting to the promised land took some time. And it wasn't easy. And it seems that for many of the Israelites, they kind of forgot how God had saved them. And over time, sin had hardened their hearts and their fear of giants and battles caused them to no longer believe God could actually give them rest. Do you know anyone who has a dramatic conversion story? They professed faith in Jesus, but over time, it fizzled out. Okay, the, the promise of rest, of life, of salvation, so what our text says, it still stands, the promise is still there, and it is for that person, but what matters most is not their dramatic conversion story. Remember, we talked about it last week, what matters is what do they believe today? Okay, the faith that secures this promise is not the faith of yesterday, but the faith of today. And the key word here is trust. Trust. If your heart is still restless, I wonder if you're struggling with trust. You've heard the gospel many times. You can explain the gospel. But you know, that's not what saves you. It's not just hearing it. It's not just being able to say it. It's trusting Jesus with your life. It's telling him, I need you. I can't do this. I'm weary. I'm burdened. And I'm coming to you, Jesus. My heart is restless and I always will be until I find my rest in you. That invitation still stands. Jesus told the people in Matthew 11 there, come to me and I will give you rest. That promise still stands. The pathway to rest begins with faith, with belief, with trust in the promise of God and his provision in Jesus. And that's really good news. Are we clear on this? Faith, belief, trust. I hope that's clear because the next step on the pathway will not make sense if you don't understand point number one. Okay, so the promise of rest is secured by ongoing faith, period. But, number two, our faith is proved through obedience. That's what the text says. Now, this can be tricky. Okay, so hang on. Look at verse 6. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter. Why? Because of disobedience. Wait, wait a minute. I thought it was belief and faith is what got you into God's rest. Yes, it is. But how do we know that some of the Israelites did not have faith? How do we know that they did not believe? The ones who did not believe did not obey. Okay, so listen, obedience does not get you in. Only faith does. But disobedience shows that you do not really believe. And again, it's not, well, there was a season of obedience in my life. Well, there was a time in my life when I obeyed. We don't accumulate frequent obedience miles, you know, that we can redeem later. Yeah, but God, when I was young. No, the season that matters is when? Now. It's today. It's the most important day of your spiritual life. Today. So there's a key word here, and it's urgency. Urgency. It's not this. Oh, you know, I will get serious about obedience tomorrow. I, I'm really going to get serious about following Jesus after the holidays. Um, you know, when I get married, when we have kids, or 
Now, once I get established in my career, <laughs> I'm going to get serious when, when I retire. I just don't have time right now. No. Today. Today is the day. So let's read uh, chapter 4, verses 6 to 11. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through the day, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, for the third time, ready? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Okay, so this is not talking about being perfect. That is not possible. So our obedience is always going to be imperfect. The issue is, are you striving to enter that rest? Are you trying? Is there a desire for obedience? Have you established a plan for obedience? Is there repentance? Is there genuine remorse for the times you fail and disobey? If, if that is true, in your life, you don't have a hard heart, okay? It, it's okay. It's not that sin's okay, but it's part of the journey of sanctification. God's promise for you is rest. So hold on to that confidence until the end. We saw that in chapter 314. Hold on to it. So what kind of disobedience are we talking about here that can prevent us from experiencing God's rest? In verse 11, this is what it says. It's the same sort of disobedience. He's referring to what the Israelites displayed. The unbelief, the hard-hearted, willful disobedience, often characterized by grumbling and complaining. Now, if that's you, you're probably not here today. <laughs> but remember, even if you are standing firm, what, what do we need to do? Be careful. Be careful lest you fall. So there's a healthy fear of our own vulnerability. There's a healthy fear of our own weakness that causes us to keep striving I want to keep reaching. Um, I want to keep trying. See, when we think of rest as taking a nap or a break, which, believe me, there's nothing wrong with a nap, but we, we miss the point of the promise. The rest that our hearts are longing for is more than that. So let's look again at, at Jesus' promise and look at a few more verses in Matthew 11. We'll put it on screen. He says, Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for what? Your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus' invitation here for rest is not Come take a nap with me. You know what a yoke is? It's for work. So Jesus is actually inviting us to join him, to learn from him how to really live, how to work side by side in meaningful work while he bears the burden and the weight. And what does he say we will find when we actually yoke ourselves to him? We will find rest, for your souls. Rest for your souls. That's what our hearts are restless for. 
Not for a nap, but for purpose, for meaning, and a relationship with God. Faith is what secures this rest. But a pattern of obedience, striving, it's the fruit that we should expect that proves our faith is genuine. Right? This is very clear throughout Scripture. James especially talks about this. James 1, he says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Right? What does he mean by that? Well, he talks about it more in James 2. He says, So also, faith by itself, it's just words, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. It's the evidence. Well, you say you believe that God is one. Well, good job. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Okay, so just acknowledging words only is not true faith. True faith has fruit. So this promise of rest is secured by faith. Our faith is proven through obedience. And then the third thing on this pathway to rest, our obedience is measured by God's word. All right, let's read the rest of this, starting in chapter 4, verse 11 to 13. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So how do we know if we are actually obeying God? How do we know if we're actually on the path that leads to rest? See, we have to listen to what God has said, what he's saying today, and then we need to measure our lives by that standard. So the key word here is accountability. Accountability. God is not who we want him to be. He is who he is. The path to life and rest is not what we want it to be. It's what God has said it is. And as we said, we saw it in Hebrews chapter 1, God is speaking to us. And the clearest, most authoritative voice of God that we have it is, is what is recorded right here in God's Word. It's in the Bible. He speaks in other ways, but this is what we know. This is the most authoritative source we have to know if what God is saying, that's what he's saying. So notice in verse chapter 3, verse 7, in, um, and in chapter 4, verse 7, the preacher is quoting the same Psalm 95. So 3, 7, and 4, 7. In 3, 7, he says, as the Holy Spirit says, and then in chapter 4, verse 7, talking about the exact same passage, he says, saying through David so long ago, in the words already quoted. So which one is it? The Holy Spirit speaking or David speaking? Well, it's both, right? 2 Peter chapter 1 says this, no prophecy of Scripture, nothing in here comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. This is what happened. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's inspiration. In 2 Timothy 3, it says all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. And I want to just take a few minutes just to kind of emphasize this because, hey, you have options when it comes to uh, churches in Naples, right? There's options. Why do we have so many different kinds of churches? Well, 
you know, different kinds of culture and the gospel can be expressed in, in any culture in ways that are unique to that culture. So I don't have a problem with different styles, different music, some that are more formal, some that are more informal. Um, but the one thing that should never change is this. God's Word. Um, we are unashamedly a Bible church. Uh, I wish every church was a Bible church. Some of them are. But this should be your first concern when you look for a church. It's not the music. It's not the kids' program. It's not the building. It's not the size. It's this. What does this church believe about the Bible do they actually practice what they say they believe? Yeah. And so, you know, we're very clear about what we believe about the Bible. It's on, in our statement of faith. It's on our website. In fact, I'm going to put it on the screen. And just to be reminded, this is what we've said we believe about the Bible. Ready? I'll just read it. We believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors as the verbally inspired word of God. The Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches obeyed in all that it requires and trusted in all that it promises. Are you glad that's what we believe about the Bible? Yes. I hope so. Now the question is, do we practice it? Do we prioritize the Word of God? Do we allow God to speak to us on a regular basis? When you come to church, does the pastor talk about whatever's on his heart? Or does he point you to God's word? Does he herald what is on God's heart? Now, is Sunday morning the only time of the week when you hear what God is saying in his word? I hope not. I mean, if this is, as we've said here, the ultimate authority on every human endeavor, here's what we should be doing. You ready? pulling it out every day. We should be calling to mind scriptures that speak to the decisions that we're making all day long. Here's an example. You know, when you're building a house, there's a lot of tools that you need to build a house. But uh, one of the most important ones is a tape measure, right? Um, you use it all the time. It's the standard to measure the work that you're doing um, because it keeps you aligned with the blueprints, the plan for the house. If, if you said, you know, I, I just use my tape measure on Sundays. I kind of wing it throughout the week. How's that house going to look? It's going to be a mess. No, that, that tape measure is on your belt and you are using it all day long in the work of building because you need accountability to a standard. You can't just make it up throughout the week. So this, this is why we really emphasize having a quiet time, a chair time, a time with you, God's word, just listening to what he's saying, writing down in a journal what he's saying to you. I know a lot of people who read devotional books, Jesus Calling, My Utmost for His Highest, Daily Bread. Hey, those can be great. But what you're actually reading when you're reading a devotional is what God was saying to that person through his word. All right, we benefit from that. Just like when I'm in a small group or we gather with the men at Panera Bread at 7 o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays, someone shares what they heard from God that they wrote down in their journal, God speaks to me through what God spoke to them. But God wants to speak directly to you through his word, not just through others. You have to listen. 
you have to slow down enough to create a space where you actually read the Bible. And you stop and you ask God to speak to you. And when he does, you, you write those things down. Why do I have to write them down? Well, it's important because um, we forget. But even more so because that time that God is speaking to you is not all about you. When you write it down, you can share what you've learned with others. And, and God uses that. It, this is the highlight, friends, of my week. When I'm with others, when I'm with these men at breakfast or on Zoom or in a small group, having lunch or coffee with, with one of you and, and you pull out your journal and you share what God is saying to you through his word. I long for you to hear God speak to you through his word. You know, it was, it was in the newsletter on the Sunday. It's on the back table every week. There's a little tip sheet, okay, of how to have a quiet time or chair time. You can use any journal. Just take any book of the Bible. Just get started. It will change your life. Why will it change your life? Hebrews 4, verse 12. We read it. The Word of God is living and active it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So let's look at each of those. First, God's word is living and active. Some of you have a testimony. You heard a testimony of how someone was lost, didn't know God. They began to read the Bible, and it changed their life. I know many people who just began reading the Gospel of John and they believed. See, the words that are in your Bible are not just ancient words on a page. When you read these and speak them to others, they are alive. God is in them. God uses them in our lives. Isaiah 55, verses 9 to 11 says this. For as, high, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, um, God says, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Okay? I mean, the wonder of nature, you know, the wonderful rain that at least we got at our house yesterday is just feeding, bringing things to life. He says this, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God is sending his words to us. So if you have a Bible in your hands today, I hope you do, you're holding words that have power to change your life, power to change others' lives and the world around you. You need this far more than you need a tape measure. Build a house. Second, it says God's word is sharp and it's piercing. Now, this might be the reason you avoid the Bible. Okay? It's too convicting. God's word can be like a scalpel, exposing things in our lives that need to be removed. It, it can be invasive and disruptive, like a surgeon going to work. But that work is meant to help us to heal us, to remove what is hurting us. Now, this is why I, I recommend just reading through the Bible for your quiet times. Um, it's why here we often just preach through books of the Bible. It's hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so God's word provides accountability. It's a standard that's actually measuring us as we read it. So whether you read the Bible or not, right there it says in verse 13, we are going to give an account to God. Wouldn't it be better to know what God actually expects from us? What the standard is? Yes. But what does it say in verse 11? 
Knowing all of this, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. We've got God's word to measure our obedience. So are we on track? Are we heading in the right direction? Okay, ignorance is not bliss in this. Hiding our heads in the sand, pretending we're okay, it's not going to get us to this place of rest. The invitation still stands. Jesus is saying this right now. It's a promise he's making. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my hope upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. If you do that, you will find rest for your souls. Jesus wants you to find his rest. So let's come to him in faith. Let's live out our faith in obedience. Let's listen to what God is saying to us, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, as it says, every day. Because today is the most important day in your spiritual life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Um, Lord, thank you that your, your promises never fail. They are new every morning. As you say in your word, great is your faithfulness, O oh God. So we want to cling to your promise. We want to cling to you, Jesus. We, we come to you because that is where this promise is fulfilled. It's not fulfilled in religion. It's not fulfilled even in our obedience, Lord. It is in faith and trust in a sense of urgency, as we follow hard at you, as we measure our lives by your 